I will be covering the travel voucher training. You should be looking at this packet. You're probably looking at this and saying, wow, that's a lot to fill out on a voucher. Don't be afraid. The travel voucher is this big. So you want to keep this with you so that we can go over the voucher. When I say front page, back page, I'm talking about this travel voucher here. Everything that is in this packet will be on the screen up here. It's a copy of the travel voucher and it's broken down into sections. It has all the notes listed in there for you so that you will be able to follow each section. Please remember to keep all your questions until after we are done. Our course objectives are to discuss what items are required by the law to be filled out on a travel voucher and to explain each section of the travel voucher. Before making your reservations, if you have an overnight stay, you must look up the allowable meals and lodging rate for the location that you will be traveling. Please log into the following website to see the rates. GSA rates, GSA stands for the General Services Administration. Once you log into the website, you will be able to search by city or zip code to get the meal and lodging rates for the location you will be traveling. So for example, your meal plus lodging equals your allowable daily rate. So in your travel voucher packet, I have two examples. One is Corpus Christi and one is San Antonio. Those are gonna be two examples of some travel that you're, the traveler is going to be doing. When you pull up the GSA website, this is gonna be the first page you're gonna see. So if you see here, we've entered a zip code. If you know the zip code of the hotel where you're staying, you can just enter the zip code into the zip code section. And once you hit enter, it'll give you the allowable rates. So our first location is Corpus Christi. The county is Nueces, and these are the months for the year, down here is the rate of the lodging, and over here where you see the $51, that's the meal rate. So for June, the hotel rate is $97, and the lodging rate is $51. If you add up your hotel and your lodging rate, you get an allowable daily rate of $148. The second example shows, let's say you don't know the zip code, so you know what city you're going to, you can plug in the information by entering the city and then you will select the state. Once you hit enter, you will get the allowable daily rates for San Antonio and you'll see the rates for June is $110 for lodging and $66 for your meals. If you add your lodging and your meal rates, you get an allowable daily rate of $176. So if you're following along in your packet, we're going to be on section 613, page eight. And on page nine, you'll see the notes that will tell you exactly how to fill out the voucher. It's the same as this one, only we're breaking it down by sections, okay? Everything that you see colored in is the only areas that you will have to fill out. Anything that's not colored in, you don't have to worry about. The first area we're looking at is number six. This is the document date. This is the first date of travel. When you enter that date, you only need to enter numbers. You don't need to enter any slashes or dashes. So for example, this date is 050114. That's exactly how you enter it. If you enter a slash or a dash, you're gonna get some crazy number up here and you're gonna think you messed something up. Just back out and only enter your numbers. Once you hit enter, the slashes or the dashes will be entered on the date for you. I'm gonna mention number nine, it's not colored in, but the reason why I wanna mention this is because this amount here is going to be the amount that the inspector will be reimbursed. This amount automatically fills in once you enter the rest of your numbers in the travel voucher. So you will know that this is exactly what you're getting reimbursed. 
Number 10 on the pay to section, this information here is the inspector information. Now, please remember that this name and address should be listed exactly how you have it on your TDLR contract. So if you have a nickname, don't put your nickname in here, just put your name that is on the contract. The Texas identification number. This is an important number. This number is issued to each traveler. This is the number that will pay the person who is traveling. And this number will be given to you by the program manager who is currently Greg Alvarez. He will provide you with this number and once he does, for every travel voucher you submit, you will enter this number into line 13 of the Texas identification number. I wanna mention these tabs down here. This voucher is on an Excel spreadsheet. So in order for you to move from front page one to back page two, you will have to click on the back page two to get to the next page and so on and so forth. So if you open it up and you complete the first part and you're thinking, how do I get to page two? Remember the tabs at the bottom. Once you click them, then you'll move on to the next page. Section 15, this is a blank section on the voucher. I just put this in here just so that you can see that it's part of the voucher, but you don't have to worry about it because that's for agency use. Now we are on section 16 through 18 of the travel voucher. This is where you will list all your information, your balances, all your travel expenses. So if you see on line 16, we have a date of 050414. This date is the date you've already completed your travel and you're back home. So this date should be entered on line 16. You don't have to enter the slashes or the dashes, just the numbers. Once you hit enter, they'll be in there. On 18 in the distribution section, remember we're only covering the colored areas. If you look under the blue area, this is fares public transportation. So if you catch a taxi, if you fly and have airfare, or if you use a rental car, you will have to manually insert those totals in the box. Once you enter those totals in the box, if you look under the amount section, you will see a total, for example, on this page, they use taxi, airfare, and rental car, and it totaled up to $392. If you notice that section is not colored, that will automatically be filled in once you enter those totals in the boxes. So you don't have to worry about that. Personal car mileage, the mileage rate, and meals and lodging. This section is not covered in. You will have to be concerned with this in just a minute, but as soon as we get to back page two that covers that section, we'll come back to this and I'll let you know why it is important for you to remember this, okay? Please know that the mileage rate will change at times. If it does change, the program manager will give you a copy of the updated travel voucher. On your parking, sometimes when you're parking, you don't have a parking receipt. If it's an unmanned parking, if it's a meter parking, you won't have a receipt for that. So if you don't, what we need you to do is list under the parking section the date. So for this one, they had an unmanned parking on 5114 for a total of $15. In this section, you do have to enter the slashes. They don't automatically get put in. If you'll see 5-2, we entered 5 slash 2 slash 14, $12 for meter parking. This is where you will list your parking dollar amounts. If you notice under the amount section, it's colored un in green. This is because on this line, this will not automatically add in to the amount section. So you will have to add up your parking and enter the amount under the amount section. On your incidental expenses, we have listed here hotel taxes. This will be all your city, state, county taxes. You just add them all up from your receipt and you list them under this section here. If you notice under the amount section, it's colored in, so you will have to enter those in. All these amounts listed under the amount section will add up automatically under the totals. You don't have to worry about it. Once you've entered all these amounts in here, it will automatically add into your total section at the bottom. 
this total section also will add into the dollar amount that I told you on the first part where it's at what amount you will be reimbursed. This is your reimbursed amount. And this is one way to check if your numbers are right. If this amount and the amount on section on the first section add up the same, then you know you have your dollar amounts correct. Now we are at the bottom of the travel voucher, section 19. This is for the original signature of the payee, the inspector, and the date they signed the voucher. Please remember to sign your voucher or else it'll be sent back for signature. If you look down here on the bottom tabs, we have completed front page one of the travel voucher. So now we're gonna complete back page two. So if you click on back page two, this is what comes up, the itemization section of the travel voucher. In this section, you will list your meals and lodging. Under section A, leave headquarters. The first date you're gonna enter is the date, the first date that you travel. And this is 050114, just numbers only. Once you tab over to the hour, to enter the hour and the minute, it automatically insert those dashes for you. So you will list nine, this person, they left at nine o'clock, so they put nine for the hour, zero, zero for the minutes, and they put A for AM. Down in line D, this is the meals not to exceed the maximum rate and the lodging not to exceed the maximum rate. So on this example, this is the first trip. This was your Corpus Christi trip. Remember when we were looking at the GSA rates, we said the hotel was 97 and the meals were 51 for a daily rate of 148. Looking at this example, you will see that the lodging shows 105. How do we put 105 if we're only allowed $97 for lodging? Sometimes lodging areas you cannot find the maximum rate. So what you can do is you can use part of your meal money to make up the difference in your lodging. So in this section, it's $8 different for the lodging. So they took part of that $51 and they used $8 of it to make up for the lodging rate. Please remember that you can use your meal money for your lodging, but you can never use lodging for your meals. Very important. So we got a total of $147.95. We're in the allowable daily rate, because the total you couldn't exceed was $148. So we're good. So on day two, we're still, on, we're still in Corpus on the same travel. So you'll enter the date as 050214, numbers only. You look in the meals section and they're claiming $46 for meals. We're in the lodging section. You don't see a lodging rate here. The reason for this is because as we go down further to explain the description, this traveler decided they wanted to stay with a friend or a relative, and that's fine, you can do that. You can stay with a friend or relative. You won't claim the lodging, you'll only claim your meals. That's why you don't see a total in this section. On 5-3-14, we're no longer in Corpus Christi anymore. We've gone on and moved on to San Antonio now. So we will enter the dates at 050314, numbers only again. The meals were $53.25 and the lodging was $89. Now, if you remember on the GSA rate, the lodging was 110 and the meals were 66, which gave you an allowable daily rate of 176. So you can tell just by looking at this that their meals and their lodgings totaled to 142.25. They could go up to 176. So they're in the daily allowable rate. Now, this is the return date. All their travel's done, they're going back home. So you move the date when you come back home to arrive headquarters and you will enter the date that you came back, 050414, the time, 1.15 p.m. And your meals, $25.36.
you're still on travel status. You may be doing something. You, you can claim your meal when you come back. If you notice at the bottom on the total section, it, your totals for your meals and lodging added up to $361.56. Now remember, on the front page, I told you there was a section that wasn't colored in. It was meals and lodging, and it was the, the miles. This is where I said it will automatically be entered in the front page. So if you look at it and you look at $361.56 on the travel voucher, you will see under the meals and lodging section, there's an amount in there of $361.56. It adds it up automatically for you on the first page. This is one of those numbers you don't have to plug in. We should be on page 17 of your packet, and this is the purpose of your trip. This is where you're gonna list everything you did on your trip. So on the first date, remember we were in Corpus Christi? Under the date section, again, you just enter numbers only. Once you tab into the information that's required by the state of Texas for the allowable rates, this person left from their residence. They went to the lodging at the Holiday Inn. Please remember that when you list the locations, you must list the location name and the address. If you're going back and forth to the same location and you're on the same travel date, you only have to list the address one time, okay? So the traveler left from their residence and they went to lodge at the Holiday Inn at 1102 South Shoreline in Corpus Christi. The mileage from the residence to the lodging was 86.15 miles. So under the miles, mileage point to point section, they will list the miles. <coughs> then they went to 1901 North Shoreline where they had a weigh-in for event number 42159. The mileage from the hotel to the weigh-in was 10.26 miles. After the weigh-in, they went back to lodging. <coughs> Notice how I didn't put Holiday Inn again or the address because we're still going back to the same location. And then they listed their miles, okay? The next day on 5-2-14, they left from the lodging, which is the same location, to the event. Now, I understand sometimes the weigh-in and the event might be at a different location. So if it is at a different location, you'll enter the information for the event location with the address. F on this example, I'm only showing that the weigh-in and the event were at the same location. There's, therefore, you won't see an address here. When they went from lodging to event, they didn't claim any miles because they decided they're gonna ride with another inspector. So they didn't have to claim the miles. The only person who will claim the miles is the inspector that drove. Once they left the event, they decided that they wanted to lodge with a friend. Remember the example where we had no lodging? They went to lodge with a friend. Now, if you lodge with a friend or a relative, you don't have to put that person's name. We don't need that information. All we need to know is if it was a friend or a relative and the address. They didn't have any mileage claim. When they don't have any mileage claim, they need to list the name of the inspector who they rode with. This avoids us from having to ask, did you forget to claim your miles? Did you use a rental car and forget to submit the receipt? That's the reason why we need this information, so that we don't have to go back and forth and ask you for that information. After the Corpus Christi trip, we went to San Antonio, and we'll enter the date 050314. We left from this lodging with a friend, so we don't have to enter that information, and we went to 100 Montana Street in San Antonio for event number 42194. Then we listed our mileage section, our miles under the mileage section. After the event, we went to lodge at La Quinta. We're on a different trip, so we do have to make sure we put the name and the address of the lodging location. On 5-4, we're done with our travel, we're going back home. So we left from our lodging and we went back to the residence. And we put our mileage under the mileage section from the lodging to the residence. One thing to remember when you're calculating your lodging, I mean your mileage. Our agency uses Google Maps. That's the maps of our agency's choice. So everybody needs to use Google Maps. If you don't use Google Maps, you can use your odometer reader. 
Those are the only two ways you can calculate your mileage. And that is that information is in your packet for you. Let's say you had more than two trips. I don't have enough room on my page. What am I going to do? We're going to go back down and click on back page three. And there'll be continuation sheets for each location for any additional travel that you need to list on the voucher. So let's talk about our supporting documentation. This is the documents that are needed to be attached with your travel voucher. Please make sure you have all these documentations attached to the voucher. If you don't, we'll have to contact you and tell you we're missing some information and it could hold up the process of your travel voucher. These are uh, receipts that must be attached to the travel voucher. You must include a copy of your hotel receipt, airfare receipts, rental car receipts, taxi receipts, parking receipts unless meter or unmanned parking, and gas receipts if you're using a rental car. On your lodging receipt, these are the requirements this is what needs to be on your lodging receipt. The name and the address of the hotel. The name and the address of the inspector. The single room rate and a daily itemization of the lodging charges. Proof of payment and a zero balance. This is a copy of a lodging receipt. If you notice up here, this is the traveler and this is his information. Under the date section, all the dates that you were traveling should be listed in this hotel that, that you stayed at. This is a description of what the rates were. So this is a room charge, hotels, uh, taxes, and city taxes. And over here are the charges. This is proof of how it was paid. This was paid by Visa. And this is the total, 20240. Underneath the total is a balance, zero, zero. Your receipt must show a zero, zero balance. If you get a copy of your receipt and it doesn't show the zero balance, please go to the front desk clerk and tell her, I need a copy of a receipt showing a zero balance. If you don't have, if you don't get the copy of the receipt with the zero balance and you show the total, you will be asked to get a copy with a zero balance. On this, at the bottom of the hotel receipt is the hotel information. Sometimes it'll be listed on top. In this example, it was listed on the bottom. So you'll see what hotel they stayed at and the address. This is the hotel information. These are some helpful reminders. It is recommended that all travel vouchers be submitted for payment after each event or monthly at the latest. This will ensure that all vouchers are paid in a timely manner. Make sure all supporting documents are included with your travel voucher. Contact the Combative Sports Program Manager to get your Texas identification number. Please be sure to check the GSA rates prior to making your travel arrangements. And once again, I've listed the website for you. All travel vouchers must be submitted by mail, email, or fax. I have put a copy of the email address, the fax number, and the mailing address in your packet. This completes my presentation on travel training. And if anybody has any questions, I can take those now. When you're making your reservation, can you say that you're on state business with TDLR to get the state rate at a hotel? No, you can't. Contract inspectors can't. Um, do you do partial day per diems? No. 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 And since you're not turning in your meal receipts, you cover tips, and I assume you do not cover alcohol. We do not cover the tips or the alcohol. Meals only, and it's actual meal total. On uh, the first page, actually on the first side, on page one of the travel voucher, um, how do we cover like tollways, like toll tag uh, expenses? I'm sorry, under incidental expenses, okay. you can also list your toll fees under the incidental expenses. So in the pink section, under that, if it doesn't fit on that one line, you can enter them on the next line. Okay, and when staying at a hotel, mm -hmm. um, do we need to stay at the hotels you recommend here? Or can we like, cause I know some people here probably get a discount through their 
company or if they work for the state or something, um, are they allowed to stay at a different hotel than, As, than what's offered on that website? On the website, those are only the rates. Okay. The whole, the, it doesn't list any hotels. It only lists your allowable daily rates. Okay, so so okay. as long as you don't go over your allowable daily rate, you can stay there. Okay, yes. thanks. You're welcome. So with the mileage, do we add the gas in as well, or is that all mileage as well? Okay. Under the mileage section, and one thing I forgot to mention was you can only claim miles if you're using your own personal vehicle. If you're using a rental car, then that's the only time you can claim the gas, okay? Also, one thing I forgot to mention, and I apologize, under the mileage section, please remember that those are actual miles. So if you have a mileage of 10.56 miles, you do not round up the mileage to 11.00 miles, okay? When we stay at the hotel, we don't show our badge to pay the state rate? You don't. You're not a state employee, so you will not get the state employee rate. Okay, if you need any assistance, we can be reached at expenditure.team at tdlr.texas.gov or at 512-463-1052. Thank you.